This is Dennis McMahon and welcome to Positively Vermont. And my guest today is Ruby Baker, who is the executive director of COLV, the Community of Vermont Elders. And uh, that organization has some very interesting and exciting programs that uh, she is gonna tell us about and how uh, you uh, and your uh, associates can get involved uh, in some of these vital projects that are going on right now uh, in, uh, in Vermont uh, during this uh, pandemic time. And uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, Ruby. Well, thank you so much for having me here, Dennis. Um, I'm Ruby Baker. I was born and raised here in Vermont uh, on the edge of the Northeast Kingdom, where I still live with my family. And I've been the executive director at Community of Vermont Elders for uh, three years as of today, in oh, fact. Today is my anniversary. So, Happy anniversary. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's been a really exciting and interesting three years um, just working and getting to know about everything that's going on at Cove and all across the state to help older adults um, age comfortably and and with intention and decision. So I, I've loved maybe not every minute, but most of the minutes of my three years here. Well, that's great. It's been a very exciting time and we'll get into some of the, those aspects, but also tell us about Cove. What is it, how it got started? Give us a little bit of the history. Yeah, so Cove has been uh, around since the early 80s. We are a nonprofit organization that was initially started to fill a gap that was identified here in Vermont, really related to the need for grassroots advocacy that represented older people. There is a lot of advocacy in our world still today that represents businesses that serve people service industries that serve people. And it's much harder to find organizations and entities that represent the people themselves. And so Cove was, that was really initially the mindset behind Cove and, and where we started from. So then, you know, fast forward 20, 30 years, here we are now, we still are doing that grassroots advocacy. We work with all our partners, um, both older adults themselves and service providers to make sure that we are, that we're striking a good balance there. Um, we've added in that time to, to what we offer, recognizing that a natural outgrowth of advocacy and policy work is education, understanding what's available to you and how to be involved, understanding how to protect yourself because government and, and um, businesses and service providers can't do it all for you. And, and really wrapping our heads around the concept that aging is something that's happening to all of us, right? We're all growing older. And if we're lucky, we will all become old. So how do you approach that with intention? How do you grow old on purpose? And, and that's sort of my, my war cry is, yes, we're going to do it. So let's do it on purpose. Let's grow old on purpose. Let's make those decisions now that, uh, that give us the best chance we can have of being the older adult we want to be, whatever that is. Well, in terms of the demographics, th doesn't Vermont have a rapidly growing aging population or uh, uh, a population uh, of aged uh, people compared to the rest of the region? I may have imagined that, but uh, I, I recall hearing some stories about it. You're not imagining it. Um, Vermont is, I believe at this point, we, we were sort of in a, in a um, dead heat with New Hampshire and Maine to see who will be the oldest state in any given week. But um, Vermont is, I think, the second oldest state right now and the most rapidly aging state. All of New England actually is, is on the older side as compared to um, to some of the other parts of the country, but Vermont is certainly um, much older. And of course, our more rural communities are tend to be the older communities as opposed to, um, I call it the banana belt over there in, in Burlington, where it's nice and warm for you guys today, I bet. Um, it is. Yeah, so, so, you know, when you look at the oldest counties in the state, um, the, the oldest county in Vermont, I believe, is Essex County. 
and the Northeast Kingdom more generally is the oldest region of the state, but the state itself has, has a rapidly aging demographic, what which is great. What, what particular problems does that present? Uh, in, in the rapidly growing and the volume uh, of uh, aging population, what particular problems does that present right now? Well, I try to wrap my head around that question and, and redirect it a little bit because I don't like to think about the aging demographic as a problem. It's not something we need to fix. It's just something that's true. And, and so I'm, I guess I wouldn't phrase it as we've got a problem and we need to fix it. Mm -hmm. But I will say that there are, there are certainly um, different types of challenges at all different age levels, right? Young children, some of the challenges we're facing are nutrition and access to childcare. As we get older, we're facing issues in workforce, workforce development, educational opportunities. So for the older population, a lot of the challenges are centered around housing, technology access, stability and income, safety. Um, and it's and it's funny, I say safety and a lot of people chuckle because Vermont's not a generally compared to the rest of the world, it's not dangerous to live here uh, or we don't think of it that way, but there are a lot of pieces of safety that, um, that go unnoticed. And it can be anything from having, you know, uh, appropriate modifications to your home to keep you physically safe from falling. Um, it can be mental health. It can be, um, it, and it can be the things that we are, that we more commonly associate with safety, like abuse and um, fraud and scam and exploitation. So, so really, um, those are the those are the big issues, and I and I think it all ties back to this commitment that Vermont has made to aging in place or aging in community, and how do we create communities that are well designed to give access to older adults to affordable housing, to financial stability, to um, medical care, mental health care, um, so. I guess that sort of answers your question. Well, I, I like the way you uh, phrased it positively, not that it's a problem, it's an opportunity uh, to uh, get people in touch with services. So that, that's really a very positive uh, uh, spin or a positive aspect of your organization. And that's what we like to emphasize, positive, positively Vermont. And in line uh, with, with that, um, I've gone through your website. It's a very good website. and. Uh, I, we're going to put that uh, uh, on the uh, on the screen here to let people know uh, how they can get in touch with you and a number of projects I see you're involved with. But let's talk about this aging in Vermont uh, resource guide uh, first. Off. Tell us about that. So aging in Vermont is uh, is I would say it is my favorite thing that I have done in the last year. Um, when the pandemic hit we realized that we needed to pivot. A lot of the work that we had been doing up until that point was going into communities and offering presentations, offering one-on-one -on -one support in person with people. And, and that's part of what has made COVID so effective over the years. And that was taken away. We couldn't do that. So then we decided, we, we realized that we needed to shift how we are thinking about the education and access piece of what we do and um, and this this idea had sort of been on the back burner for a while is, man, wouldn't it be great to have a resource guide that really was comprehensive, that was updated regularly, so it didn't get out of date, that that didn't it wasn't just a phone book, right? I don't I don't want to give everyone a phone book. We've got the internet, you can search something, everyone's got a phone book in their phone. But I wanted to provide um information about how to age well, information about what services are out there and what they do and why they're important. And so we pulled together an incredible team of volunteers and, and staff members to uh, design and publish in nine weeks, if you can believe it, we designed and published an 84-page resource guide and directory 
the director AP supports captures most of the, of the biggest services, the, the statewide services, the, the um, you know, the um, biggest service providers in, in the regions. And then the other 60 pages is really, you know, how to keep yourself safe, how to, what are the components of, um, of an estate plan? How do you um, advocate if you're interested in, in taking an advocacy role in something? So really just the information that we think people, adults need to be able to access um, as we grow older to, to live our best lives in our communities. And I would say that we tried very hard to make sure that that information was specific to Vermont. Because Vermont's special, we're unique. We have great programs and we want people to know what they are. Let me ask you this, is that, I know it's available online. Uh, I saw it on the website today and uh, I suppose you can also uh, take uh, that and, and Xerox it. Uh, are there any physical copies of this that you have? Tell us about yes, that. If I if I rotated my computer, you would see that I've got about a thousand copies sitting here in my office. Um, anybody who would like a physical copy can either email me or there's a form on our website that you could fill out and um, and we'll send you one in the mail. Um, the online version is, you can certainly download it and print it, but we've already paid for the printing. So just let us send you one. Um, and And then of course, you can just view it online as well. And it's a fully navigable. What about uh, like senior centers? There's one uh, right across the street from me and, or community groups uh, like uh, neighborhood uh, uh, preservation organizations. Can, can they get it in bulk? Absolutely. We've been delivering them all over the state for the last six months um, or nine months, I guess, at this point. Um, and we're still we're still dropping off deliveries. I think we brought 200 up to uh, Agewell last week. We brought some more out to Cider. So certainly, anybody who's interested in having multiple copies um, should certainly contact us. We sent a copy out to every library in the state so that they could have one. Um, but yeah, certainly, just get in contact with us, and we will happily provide you with as many copies as you want. We want we want this out there in the world. Excellent. And uh, let's have, uh, I know we're going to put it on the, on the, on the video, but tell us your uh, address in case people are just listening. Uh, where yeah, absolutely. Um, my email address is Ruby, R-U-B-Y, B as in Baker, at vermontelders.org. Or you could email Cove at, Cove at vermontelders.org, C-O-V-E. What about the mailing address in, in Montpelier? Our physical mailing address. Yeah. Or our, our mailing address is P.O. Box 1276, Montpelier, Vermont, 05602. Excellent. Now that we got all that out of the way, I, I want to go into some of your uh, specific projects that are going on right now. Let's talk about hearing aids. Tell us about that project. Yeah. Um, I didn't know much about hearing aids when I first started at Cove. And since I've been here, my father has, has gotten hearing aids and I've been learning more and more about just how challenging that the experience of hearing loss can be for an individual. And, um, and then in the course of our advocacy work, I discovered that there was a group that had been working to make sure that hearing aids were uh, included in insurance that they're and they've been working on that for I think 20 years at this point it's been a long long haul and so we we decided we needed to be involved in this as you might imagine the rates of hearing loss increase dramatically with age certainly there are many many young people who have hearing loss in Vermont in fact there are over 70,000 Vermonters with hearing loss of all of these um, but those rates do increase as you get older, and there is no insurance covered for hearing aids. And, and the piece that really um, burned me up when I discovered it is that 
Vermont is the only state in New England that does not have an insurance mandate. And that, that was the moment where I said, that's wrong. This is wrong. We knew it was wrong already. And we're behind everybody else. We think we are progressive, but we're behind on this. And we need, we need to catch up and we need to make sure that those 70,000 could be even as many as 120,000 Vermonters have access to, to the hearing aids that they need to live a high quality life. So um, we, we've been working together with this coalition, which is called Hear, Hear Vermont. Mm -hmm. And we have a petition out there if people are interested in signing it. It's on our Facebook page, it's on our website, it's been circulating the state. We have over 1,200 signatures on this petition so far, people sharing their personal stories and experiences and, um, and really recognizing how vital this is. So um, I would encourage you to sign the petition asking that, that this be taken up. And then I would also say that right now there's a bill we have a bill, H-266, yes, H-266 um, mandates hearing aid coverage through as many avenues as it is possible for Vermont to, to mandate insurance coverage. So, of course, uh, well, maybe people don't know, but Vermont doesn't um, have the authority to mandate certain categories of insurance coverage, but for the ones that we do, they're included in this bill. And, um, and the bill would set us on a path to have coverage for as many Vermonters as possible within the next several years. So um, it's really exciting. And the, the bill right now, we're just waiting for a hearing. So if you believe in this, if, if our viewers believe in this, please call your legislators. If we get a hearing this year, that makes everything move a little bit faster. And this is this is really what we're pushing for right now. Start the conversation. Excellent. Now, who's sponsoring that uh, uh, that bill H two six six? Representative Wood is the is the lead sponsor on the bill, and currently the bill is um, is waiting for its hearing in House Human uh, House Health Care Committee uh, with Representative Flipper. So. Okay. Excellent. Now, tell us a little yes. bit about uh, your work on email scams and other kinds of things that are plaguing not only uh, senior citizens, but pretty much everybody. Tell us about your work on that area. Yeah, so a huge body of our work and, and most of our staff time is dedicated really towards this, this idea around safety and um, and specifically we do a lot of work on scam and fraud prevention. Um, we have a program called the Senior Medicare Patrol that is specifically dedicated to identifying and preventing and responding to instances of, um, of Medicare fraud, error, and abuse. And, um, and I guess the piece that always just blows my mind when I think about um, Medicare fraud is that the latest, the most recent statistic I heard is that over $120 billion every year is lost to Medicare fraud. And while this isn't a direct cost to a Medicare beneficiary, our tax dollars pay for that. And, and so this is a cost to all Americans is, is that you know, $120 billion in, in fraud. Um, we also expand beyond Medicare fraud and, and do a lot of work around more general scam fraud and exploitation, looking at things like dating fraud and identity theft and other types of insurance scams. Um, we work on really educating older adults to help identify. We have a wonderful team, uh, a theater troupe based out of Eric Theater in Burlington. And they are all older adults themselves and they write skits based on their own personal experiences with um, scam and fraud and, and pieces that they've learned. 
And they really use humor and and honesty to help people wrap their heads around what could happen and help them see how how sneaky the scammers are. They're you know they are professionals. They are professional scam artists, and they are going to do their best to steal from you. So. Um, we do a lot of education around that. Our savvy seniors are incredible and they've managed to bring everything online. We had a wonderful presentation by them uh, a couple of weeks ago. And you see their, their skits and videos on our website and our, on our YouTube channel as well. Um, That's great. Let me ask you about this. I, I have to put my phone off the hook when I do this because normally it's ringing uh, with uh, scam calls. and. Uh, uh, spam calls and all that, despite numerous complaints to the Federal Trade Commission and uh, various letters to officials, uh, these things are coming in rampant. Uh, you know, with the caller ID fraud, uh, the uh, spoofing, where it looks like it's a neighbor calling. Uh, are, are you involved in that activity? Uh, preventing yeah. that kind of activity? Tell us about. It. Yeah, we partner with the Attorney General's office on a lot of that work because really they, you know, they have the authority statewide to to work on that. But I will say that again and again we run into this issue and we and and a lot of these calls originate outside of the United States or outside of the jurisdiction of our Attorney General. And so we don't have the ability to stop them in many cases they are by by attempting to steal from people they're already breaking the law so, so we don't have much ability to stop them uh, and what we tell people is to hang up don't talk to them don't engage in that conversation uh, every time you talk to somebody who is a potential scammer, they are gathering information about you. They may hear your dog barking in the background and next time they call with a a pet-based scam, they may hear a name spoken in the background while you're talking to them and then they they know that they can call using that name or trying to connect with that person. So don't talk to them, just hang up the phone. Um, They are professionals and they are gathering every piece of information they can about you to customize their approach and um so that that's the advice we give to people right well let's, uh, there's another thing that's going on apparently and it's very timely right now uh and your organization is working to prevent it uh, the vaccine situation uh, tell us about that uh are there some um, vaccine scams going on and that kind of yes thing? there have been vaccine scams happening across the country um and some of them are are related to like Eventbrite and other um, ticket sales sites that claim that the sites aren't doing this, but someone is using the site to claim that they can sell you a ticket for a vaccine. Um, you do not have to pay for a vaccine in Vermont, and if you have questions call the Vermont Department of Health. Do not pay for a vaccine. Do not pay to jump ahead in line. That's not real. Um, And all older Vermonters, in fact, everyone over the age of 40 is eligible for a vaccine as of today. So, um, you know, if you are interested in getting a vaccine, call the Vermont Department of Health website. I mean, call their phone line or get on the website or connect with your your local um, pharmacies. And, and go through those proper channels. If someone contacts you and, sit and says that they have uh, a way to jump the line or, um, you know, that's not real. Mm-hmm. Well, another thing uh, uh, maybe you could help us with now is this, uh, uh, is a boom in it, uh, and, and that is remote, remote learning and uh, support for remote learning. In fact, uh, many uh, organizations now are running uh, meetings exclusively on Zoom. And I'm sure that uh, everybody, including senior citizens, uh, needs help with that. Tell us what you're doing in that area. Oh, so many things, Dennis. We've been doing so many things around technology access and and adapting to this new world of of remote interaction. Um, 
I would say that the first thing that we, we recognized that we needed to do is we needed to help older adults who had never used Zoom or WebEx or Google Meet or any of the other platforms. We needed to help them figure out how to do that. And so uh, early, early on, I think in, in April or May of last year, one of our staff members, a couple of our staff members started being available to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Everything from, I will sit on the phone with you and I will help you move your mouse to the right place. Um, we can do screen share. And we've even had some circumstances where two people get together in the same room, fully masked and, and work through how to use your device, whether it be a tablet or a computer or a, a smartphone so that you can access. And another piece that, that was really um, nerve wracking for a lot of people, maybe wasn't downloading the software or logging in, but just feeling unsure of the, the um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The sort of the protocol, right? How do you, what are the behavioral activities? Oh, how, yeah. Right. Yeah, what are the rules of this new new remote society? So um, we put together some some videos and trainings and and um, help people to help people understand uh, how to mute. You know, how do you have to show your video? How do you? What are the rules of engagement here that that um, we're starting to identify and understand? So we've done a lot of that one on one work. We also um, we also moved our educational presentations online. So every two weeks we have uh, a Zoom call and then it's put up on our, um, on our YouTube channel. And we cover everything from presentations from the Poison Control Center and the Federal Trade Commission, all the way to, we've had theatrical performances and readings. Last week we had uh, an armchair hike with a retired, um, uh, because, hey, we were camping she and we used to work as a park a ranger brand, in a national park. So we've we've had a wide brand. range of, we'll of different nice types of presentations that range from the fun and silly all the way to the very serious and sometimes um, scary topics that we need to be thinking about and addressing. So those pre those happen every other week, and you can find them. Um, on our Facebook, you can join our mailing list, and you'll have an update about them every week, every other week. Um, and then I guess the last piece that was a smaller piece, but still um, just very exciting to start thinking about these types of opportunities. We were talking with someone who had a, a, a young son in high school who was feeling very isolated, mm -hmm. and and we said, you know, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could connect these isolated young high school students with isolated older adults and they could share thoughts and experiences and feelings. And it's, and, you know, it's not one person doing the other a favor. It's just mutual connection. So we set up a pilot program called Connecting over the summer where um, we, we went through a training and a pairing process and we paired people um, who then had a weekly call, one hour every week where they just talked about things. We had a group that was, we had a pair that was really interested in um, Eastern European dance. We had a pair that is really interested in climate change and they've, they connected with each other. And, and I think all of our pairs at this point have remained in contact with each other throughout the year, even after our pilot program ended. So we're, we're doing that again this summer to bring older adults and, and younger adults together to think about and to bridge generations. Um, we're all humans and we all have similar experiences that we wanna share and talk about and think about. So um, I'm really excited about it. I think it's, it's so cool. Uh, someone who grew up with with her grandmother in town and really had the opportunity to hear those stories and and understand some of the history behind them it was it was incredible that's 
amazing. That's, your, your organization really seems to be getting ahead of, of a lot of things. You know, that idea of isolation uh, caused by the pandemic. You know, I, I've seen, I follow this very closely, particularly with studies that are going on now in Britain, which had it before us. There are massive studies coming out of the UK and also coming out of Canada about the uh, impacts uh, on everyone, uh, particularly senior citizens and uh, other communities uh, about the isolation caused by this. And of course, the studies are there. They're very frightening in a way. Uh, they're medically based and uh, psychologically based, but the need is doing something about it. And you seem to be addressing that. Well, I would say, Dennis, that, that while we're, we've all had a taste of isolation in the past year, but this was an issue long before the pandemic for older adults. Mm -hmm. And we've known for a long time that, that this is a problem, that this is, a, that this is something that we need to be addressing as a society. I, I think the, uh, the Gates Foundation came out with a study almost, almost 10 years ago at this point that, again, medically based, that was able to um, to prove that isolation is worse for you than smoking 15 cigarettes a day and kills more people than diabetes. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is so damaging to our well-being. And it's such a complicated issue that as, as a society across the country and here in Vermont, we're not entirely sure how to deal with it. But I think everyone having had a chance to feel isolation in the last year helps. Um, that's, that's amazing. Uh, how you on top of everything, and it, it must be really uh, challenging. Uh, and which me, leads me to uh, one of the most important questions we always ask uh, guests on Positively Vermont. What do you need? What do you need from the general public, uh, the legislature, uh, anyone viewing uh, us or community organizations? How can people help you, help them? I need so many things. I can't even begin to list them all, Dennis. But what I, what I need most, what, and it's not me that needs it, what we all need most is to acknowledge that we're aging and to think about it and to accept it and, and, to, and to age on purpose. We all need to do that. We need to plan for our own older lives. But in terms of COVE, in terms of our specific work that we need to, that we need help with, um, I would say that there are several ways that people can help. Being informed is a huge part of it. Again, we are an advocacy and education organization. So sign up for our mailing list, become a member of COVE, and we will help keep you informed so that you know what's going on and, and where the pressure points are that you can become involved, how to volunteer with us, how to um, you know, share information and, and engage in our programming. So I would encourage anyone who, who is interested to go to our website and um, sign up to be a member, sign up for our mailing list, get a copy of our resource guide. All of those pieces are really important. And then more specifically for people who are interested in the advocacy piece and that, and that grassroots movement to support older adults across the state, there are a couple of ways to be involved. If you're specifically um, inspired by the hearing aid coverage, which I am, and I'm, I, I can talk for the entire time about this, just this piece, um, contact your legislators and let them know that we need the hearing now. We need, we need to be able to tell them our story this year, not next session, not five years from now. We need to pass this bill, and if, if not now, when? Um, so contact your legislators, sign the petition, tell us your story, um, write letters to the editor, be involved. And more broadly, if you're interested in engaging in policy, we have a, a small group that meets every week called Grow Bold. And... Um, we are, we, COVE supports this small group of advocates to be engaged in the issues they care about. Um, a lot of people say, oh, older adults are only advocating for nursing homes and health care. Well, older adults are also human beings who have personal interests and things that you care about. So 
Uh, we have someone in our team who cares a lot about climate change and advocates on issues of climate change. And we help him, um, you know, find the right people to access. We help him follow bills and, and, and provide the scheduling. And then we talk through issues and how to be engaged in them. And, you know, there are many, many issues like that that go far beyond what someone might pigeonhole as an older adult issue. Mm -hmm. And um, so we care a lot about human beings as their whole selves. That's great. So, That's wonderful. And of course, there are ways that foundations and uh, various other people can contribute financially or they're open to that. And uh, I'm oh, yes. Yes. If you want to give us money, please give us money. But uh, you know, there are so oh. many ways to be involved in, in this. I always like to bring that up at, at some point. And, uh, that always means we're getting near the end. And this is really has been a very interesting uh, conversation and uh, certainly to be followed up. Uh, I urge people to take a look at the website and uh, I'm sure Ruby's available to be contacted if you or your organization uh, want more information or to volunteer and assist in any way. So thank you very Absolutely. much. Uh, thank you very much, Ruby. And, um, my guest today has been Ruby Baker, the executive director of COLE, a community of Vermont elders. Uh, and, and thank you uh, so much for having me, Dennis. Thank you. You've been really, really a, a great to uh, bring us up to date on so many issues. So thank you all. And thank you for watching Positively Vermont. This is Dennis McMahon.